Welcome to another episode of the podcast. We're at Springer headquarters and we have a very exciting guest, Dr. Enrique Cruz. He came all the way from Austin, Texas for a couple of our events and I was able to lock him for a podcast. So there's a couple of exciting topics we want to cover. The first one is Smile Direct Club, teledentistry, teleorthodontist and what happened from the day they created to the day they shut down. We also talk about the ortho treatment with the orthodontist versus GP. Well, I want to share some of my life story and also what it means to have different specialties. I'm very excited to be part of this. Hope you enjoy it. Ready? Ready. Dr. Enrique Cruz, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Excited to be here. The main topic for our conversation today is teleorthodontist and Smile Direct Club. But b- before we get started, you have a pretty unique background. I think I've the fir- the only person I've seen with orthodontist specialty with periodontic, <laughs> with oral surgeon. How did that happen and how many years you were in college? You know, I never thought that I would do the three of them. Uh, you know, I'm coming from a dental family and, you know, I did my dental school in Mexico where, you know, when I graduated, I said, you know, okay, what I would like to do next. Originally, I wanted to be a, a plastic surgeon. Okay? Oh, interesting. But I thought, you know, to be a plastic surgeon is going to take me too long, right? Maybe 12 years, 15 years. So what I did is, okay, I'm going to be a dentist, then I'll I will pick to do oral surgery, and then that should do it. But life took us different ways, right? Life took us in a different direction where I did my dentistry, trained in oral surgery, then I moved to the States. And when I moved to the States, I picked a program where it was a combined program in periodontics and orthodontics. And this took six extra years. So wow. with that, everything, it could have been almost 15 years, and maybe I could have been a plastic surgeon. So, but um, now that I look back, everything has been very worth it, you know. Would you have been making more money if you were a plastic surgeon? Do you think I about know. that? I would have made I more money. <laughs> I don't know. But um, <laughs> what I'm doing currently with the orthodontic community in general is very rewarding. So I think, I, we will never know. I know. We will never know. And how many years were you in school in total? So five, nine, almost around 15 years. 15 years. You know, in Mexico, you go from high school, pretty much from high school, to, to dental, dental school. Dental school. So, that you skipped a so couple of years in there. I was 21 when I graduated from dental oh, school. Wow. So imagine graduate at 21, I remember that the patients will come and say, hey, can I talk to the doctors? Like, I'm, 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 the, I'm the doctor. <laughs> I'm doctor, all skinny. On. So it was, it's very interesting. But, you know, I think it's, it just gave me the opportunity to continue studying and not being that old, right? Absolutely. And then you're practicing in Texas right now in Austin and you have a pretty unique setup there. You know, after I graduated in 2012, I moved to Austin just not knowing where to just we say we new, pick, right? We picked the city and just because it was close to Mexico, kind of easy to travel, a little warm weather and they said, you know, that's a good place to have a family and then we picked Austin. All of a sudden, we saw that the community took us, welcomed us, you know, like offering periodontics, orthodontics, and a Spanish speaker doctor, right? It just all of a sudden, it, 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 it was a boom in the Austin community. So, you know, w- right now we have three locations and we see around 350 to 400 patients a day among the three locations. And one location is massive. A- and. The main location is um, the round road location, which every day we see around 150 to 100 patients, and it's just it's just been a blessing. Austin has been a blessing for us. And you leverage social media pretty amazingly to build your client base. You know, how long did it take you? So, I'm gonna go back to the beginnings of of my clinic. Right, Sonrisas has been a um, from the beginning we pick a location where nobody will think that we will open a dental office. From there, the first approach was trying to get referrals, right? But imagine new kid on the block, yeah, so knocking hard. doors, like, hey, you know, I'm new, I just graduated, you know, double degree, and I'm a periodontist, orthodontist. And at some point I thought that the dentists around, around um, my clinic will, you know, they, they just, I don't 
think that either felt threatened or it was just the interaction that we were having was not the right interaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would come and try to be nice and offer my services. But long story short, I told one my wife one day, you know what? I cannot keep knocking doors to get patients because that's not who I am. That's not the way I want to interact and show what we can do for, for our patients. So she says, well, the, the only way, probably social media. And believe it or not, I am a very shy person. I used, well, now you don't I'm look talk. I'm, now I'm talk now. And, and, you know, after being with social media, I used to be, um, you know, I'm a doctor, right? I'm right. a doctor. I'm not going to get on social media. This is, you know, I need to be professional and act professional. But I figure out that by sharing all the experiences that the patients will have every day, the patients, the consumers, the public seeing what we were creating, start getting very excited about our services. And all of a sudden, on the beginning of Sonrisas, we were getting around 80 to 100 patients a month. Just from social? From social media, from Facebook. How many followers in different platforms do you have right now? So, right now we have more than 2 million followers. Oh, wow. More than 2 million followers. But imagine out of social media building a practice. Until today, we, we now we get some referrals from, from dental offices, sure. but our practice pretty much has been direct to consumer. And then from a monetization standpoint, definitely you build your practice with that, but non-direct, uh, non-indirect, do you make any direct money out of having millions of followers? You know, the different platforms work in different ways, right? but now there's some incentives, right, to right. create content. And we figure out that if we didn't create content, our following, it will start decreasing, or there was no good engagement. Mm -hmm. So I guess we get the benefit of getting more patients, but also getting some rewarding from the platforms, you know, platform. Instagram or TikTok, or, you know, on TikTok we have- How much are those? Are they meaningful or? You know, it, it varies, right. it varies. Like if you want to give a number, like you, $500 a month? You know, <laughs> There was a point there was around a thousand, sometimes two thousand, oh, wow. depending how much engagement we, we try. Create. The problem is that sometimes I get really busy in the practice and I cannot post daily, right? But if my concentration was just posting every day, two, three times a day, because that's what I was doing at the beginning, mm -hmm. I think we can probably make more money. Yeah, but then it become a, do you do more dentistry right, or social? Right. And I love dancing, don't take me wrong, and I love sharing edu educational stuff. But it's sometimes the practice takes what, more of my time. Do you have sometimes a nervousness? I got to post, I got to feed the algorithm. I got to, this is real. It does, it does. You know, when we started social media, um, first of all, I didn't want to do it, right? And my wife said, you know what? We should try to try TikTok, right? Or Instagram, because we stay on Facebook. That's how we build the practices at the beginning. And then we started on TikTok during the pandemic and I post a video and all of a sudden 100,000 views. And I was like, you know what? That's, that's, that's fun, right? Rewarding, that's fun, yeah. that's rewarding. I post a second video, 250,000 views. And I was like, I think we like that, you know? I like that. So we continue posting and there was a time that a video hit like 30 million views. Oh. So all of a sudden we had to, you know, post daily, right? To keep that traction, to keep that engagement. And yeah, it was stressful because we were creating three through five videos a day. So imagine posting in the morning, middle of the day, at, at night, next day, three more, Same three thing. more, three more. So I did that for three months. And then we were able to reach almost a million followers within Take three stuff. months, within three months. Whoa. So it's, it was ramp up. Ramp, ramp, ramp off, but at the same time, is it was a lot of work. It was now, as you say, I get like if I don't post in two, three weeks or or, or a week, even a week, I get that. You, you get know, nervous. Like, There's get a nervous mental health aspect of being a creator that you constantly think about creating and entertaining. And it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy because it's not only the content you have an audience, but mm. uh, rather than an audience, it's a community it is. that is waiting for you exactly. to post. So for all those creators, I think it's, it's a great thing and it's a full-time job and it's not easy. And, um, and you know, I th what we're doing right now, this exactly. is something that we're educating, we're sharing with, with your audience, but at the same time, it's something that it requires the time to, to get good content, right? And there is this perception in the dental industry that if you're KOL, you get paid by manufacturers, you get paid by here and there, and then the more social following you have. What about sponsorships? Do they really 
find their really, way? They really happen. They really happen. And I think to find a KOL uh, specific is very, um, I think it's very hard because you have to, you know, be a legit, doc- legit doctor, right? Have good following, but also be good with creation content. Right. But, uh, you know, I know that some other creators or orthodontists or dental uh, in the dental business, they have different partnerships and also also I have a partnership myself too yeah. but it's it's a great thing because at the end what we're trying to do is educate right educate and share our our expertise or sharing our knowledge or or sharing the benefits of certain products well, you are the in the AOO board you're also teaching professor at uh, San Antonio right uh-huh. uh, give us the background on that so currently, I'm the president of the Texas Association of Orthodontists. That's I one. Am, that's that's <laughs> one. I'm, of course, you know, the founder of Sonrisas uh, Orthodontics and Periodontics and the founder of Sonrisas Training Center, right. which is a dental assistant school. President of the Texas Association of Orthodontists. I'm a trustee of the American Association of Orth- or Orthodontists. Also, I'm the chair for of uh, <laughs> communications and C committee for the Southwestern Society of Orthodontists and, you know, a part-time faculty. So I'm independently wow. of the social media. How do you find time and at the same time doing your social media too? You know, I think it's, it's something that um, it's a rhythm, right? It's a rhythm. It's not necessarily finding the time, but being able to uh, accomplish all this it takes a lot of time away from the family away from the practice but also the support of my family you know in this case my wife i think it's so important to have the right support structure but also when you're passionate about what you do you can you know be part of all these all these things and a little bit of editorial comment dr cruz's uh wife is also an orthodontist you guys practice together dr farnia and hopefully we can get her on a call in some topic, getting on the podcast. I think but we should we should we try, should try to yeah. at some some point FaceTime her. The other thing I noticed about you, I think is very resonating with me and very inspiring is despite being almost like doing five different things in your professional career and running a dental practice and social media, you spend so much time with family, travel. So inspiring to see that. You know, it's... I think at the end of the day, what I want to take away is just the time that I have with my family, right? And maybe I'm trying to do all these things because I want to get to the point that my concentration will be my family. You know, right now, I'm still in a developing stage of my career, right? But I think keeping the balance is very, very hard. But, you know, having the right structure in the family is, is so important. Yeah, I remember Dr. Farnia said, Amir, we work hard to travel hard. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, true. that's our motto. That's true. You travel that's a lot true. too. Lovely. That's true. We try to, you know, I think it's not only to be in a place, it's create experiences for the family. Yes. You know, it's, I think, just taking for the, the family, for the kids, getting to eat different things, getting to be immersed in different languages, getting to be in different cultures. I think that's what is going to be more important for them because at the end, it's the exposure that we can get them, right? At the end, the experiences is what we can give them. True. So when was the first time you heard about Smile Direct Club or teleorthodontist? You know, I remember um, one time in social media. When? Right? What year was it? Maybe three, four years ago. Um, Pre-COVID. It was pre-COVID, right? And all of a sudden I see this this campaign that it was going on Instagram, on Facebook, on TV. Very strong, very, very strong, right. very strong. And I remember I told my wife, it's like, this is just a matter of time. And the reason is the concept itself of creating uh, aligners and moving teeth without a proper consultation from and and look Im- imagine me i'm a periodontist right i'm a periodontist and when you move teeth you want to make sure that you don't the mess teeth up is the gum. healthy the bone is, is sound there's no periodontal disease there's no cavity so there's different factors that is not that easy just to 
by sending your impressions or taking pictures, you can make the proper diagnosis. So at the time I, I told my wife, it's like, this is just a matter of time and it's gonna blow up and it's someday. gonna and all of a sudden we see the acceptance of the public right the acceptance just skyrocket and the price was very attractive right and the way that they were promoting not necessarily i would say against the orthodontist right it's like don't pay high the fees yeah with orthodontist just come to us i think that was not the right approach but and the eye of the public that was very attractive so all of a sudden everything keep going up and up and up but later on start seeing patients that will come to the office and say hey i had this yeah, so you start to see those. we started to see that and patients will come with periodontal disease patients will come with previous uh, problems that the patient have that they were moving their teeth without the proper consultation. Which was the first company you noticed? Smile Direct Club was the first I one? I think it was the first. Of course, there was the first one, and there's we have seen some others, but the, the model of operation is a little different, right? right? But the main one has been, you know, it was well, Smile, Smile Direct Club. Club. And then COVID helped them boom, right? Everybody was at home, yes, looking the commercials, commercial, looking your Instagram, looking your some Facebook. Some COVID money coming in, have some disposable income. And then it was Candid and Bite. Candid, very smart. I think those guys pivoted so fast. Credit to them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Bite exited <laughs> on the right time. Right. Credit to the entrepreneurs. Smile Direct Club stuck around. Stuck around and I think um, just the acceptance of the public was was great because all the you know we saw them at the Super Bowl everywhere halftime in pharmacies in, pharmacies, in Macy's in you will see the everywhere, packages yeah. everywhere and I think the their marketing campaigns were pretty strong and that's why it started working but you know now now we see the results right and they went public I think it was twenty twenty one. What was your so feeling when Not they so went public? You thought they they're winning. You know I. I think everybody is willing or companies could do whatever they 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 want, right? In terms of what can they offer to the product. The products uh, in this case was a treatment. Of course, for me, being a periodontist, orthodontist, and just a dentist in general, you know that you have to have supervision when you're moving something, right? In this case, we're moving teeth. teeth. So... In those cases, I just try it to be a way of type comments with Smile Direct Club, right? Because there you was some change. I, I was trying trying to avoid it. If a patient will come, I will say, you know, I will treat you and blah blah blah. But I was trying not to not to be on 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 the part that I was gonna be like talking about them, right? Because I did this, I, I just thought it would be a matter of time, and now we can see how how were it you par part of AAO at the time? Not at the no, time. No, not yeah. at the time. You know, I'm recently with the AAO, and of course, but. Being, I was part of the TAO, right, at the time, and we could see a lot of problems caused by, by this modality of yeah, treatment. the first time I saw it, I was like, mm -hmm. wow, is, is it that unregulated that they can deliver such treatment? You like, know, But who would regulate it back then, right? Incredibly, there was, and the, the thing that really caught my attention is that there was a Facebook group that it was all about them right and it, patients kind of like venting out I what see. was happening to them and we will see thousands of people talking and it's like how is this possible that can continue right and of course you know time will just just happen and now we can see the the results and then i think at the time i remember uh we were there were so much negative press from the dentistry community in general, orthodontists and non orthodontists. And I remember when it, the, uh, they went public, everyone was looking at the stock, kind of betting <laughs> against them. That's that's unfortunate. But everyone was waiting for AAO to do something. You know the AAO, and you know I'm I'm lucky to be part of the the association. You know as I mentioned, I'm, I'm part of the board of trustees. There's so many things going on, right? And at the end, what we're looking is for the health and for the benefit of the patient, right? We want to make sure that anything that is happening to the patients cannot affect the patients and everything is done correctly as a standard of care, right? So even though there was different instances that they tried to um, 
intercede to prevent any damages, right? There was a constant, always a constant, uh, I wouldn't say battle, right? right? But just a constant feedback to prevent those problems to happen. And for more that, you know, it's a company, right? It was a company and there's certain, reg certain regulations in different states and every state was having different issues with them. So at the end, um, it was not necessarily something that, of course, the AO was supporting the orthodontist, the AO was supporting the patients, right? But it was, I think, as I said, it was just a matter of time for the, for the company to kind of vanish. And that happened a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's not, it's pretty recent. And, but something that I have seen now, and from, it's coming from the AO and the orthodontic community, we are, you know, all those patients that were in treatment, and this is something very interesting. You know, once you were in treatment with uh, Smile Direct Club, if you once they send the, the message, you know, we are done out of business and nowhere to go. All right. So imagine send all those patients, to send everyone. an email to everybody and you're still owing some money, just keep paying and we'll send you, but there's no more treatment from coming from, from us. And that's the message that pretty much every patient got. And keep paying us. And keep paying us, right? <laughs> So it didn't, didn't make too much sense, uh, but at that moment, I feel that all the orthodontists and all the associations and even the dentists f fell in, in, a, in a kind of sympathy with the patients more. We were there before, yes, right? Yes. But now we're, you know, there's different campaigns where we're doing free cons consults for the patients, you know, if they have any problems, inclusive some other companies are also helping those type of patients. So it's very important for the patients to know that there's ways to, if you got in some, any problems with your teeth or any problems with your bite or any problems related to, to those previous treatment, you know, we have orth orthodontists that are trying to help. So what was your reaction when you saw that they're shutting down? I just felt good for the patients, you know? By any means, I was like, oh, I was happy that that yeah, company yeah, yeah, is yeah, vanished yeah, yeah. and is gone. Yeah, no, totally. no, no, I just, I just felt at ease for the truth will win. The truth will win for the patients. Right. Because at the end, as doctors, what we care is about the patients, you know? So I was, I was happy. I was happy for the patients. And I saw it right after so many ads from <laughs> different doctors trying to a little bit, I don't want to say taking advantage of it, but I saw so much ads popping up. If you're a small direct law patient, uh, come to us. Uh, did you receive any of their patients afterward? We have. We have. And usually we take uh, two to three patients a week. And luckily, there were some patients that they were starting treatment, and there has been a couple that were pretty pretty severe that they had periodontal disease and now we have to go through a different route but so far everything has been has been good and of course we're trying to help them by the way can we call your wife let's give her a try let's give her a try let's give her a Hey, what's up? Hey. We have a question. Look, look who I'm here with. Dr. Farnia, how oh, are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm, so I'm putting, you? I'm putting you and Dr. Cruz on the spot. Uh, we're oh, talking like, about Smart Direct Club. Here? Good. We're talking about Smart Direct Club and all the uh, things that are happening in the past couple of weeks. You've been hearing it. And I asked him, what does Dr. Farnia as orthodontist think about them and the patients right now that are coming to you as a post uh, shutdown of Smile Direct Club? I think in general, I know you're in the middle of the day practicing, don't want to take much of your time. What do you think? Share your thoughts with us. I'm just like so sad and kind of disappointed with such a company that gave such a false promise to all these patients, these poor patients. From beginning, I just knew that this is not going to work. Of course, teledentistry, you know, in general, it's a great option like telehealth. We all need that opportunity to not be able to have to go all the time to the offices and just keep taking time off our day. But the fact that they were just promising things, oh, yeah, it's going to be so much cheaper or it's going to be quicker and you just need this little bit of treatment. It was just such a like, you know not true it was a lie and obviously because of that now they're in this trouble because patients start learning that 
that's not true. And I actually have patients coming to me and they're like, yeah, they did this in small direct cup and they didn't finish. And then when I tell them like, okay, now you need to do this treatment. Of course, they're going to be shocked, right? Because they got this false hope from a company that now abandoned the patients. On so top how of is it, it now? How ridiculous. many of the post shutdown patients came to you? We get like um, around maybe a couple every week just to kind of see and they come in. Some of them are not bad, you know, they just have minor relapse or things. But the other ones need actual like checkups. They need to get their fillings done, cleanings done, other things done. So that's why it gets very, um, I'm just like, I feel bad for the patients. At the end of the day, you know, as a doctor, what we're trying to do is provide the best for the patient. But at the same time, what they do is just like, oh, you know what? We're here to make money. We're going to promise you it's only going to be $150 a month. Keep paying your money, but we're done. We're not going to yeah, see you Yeah, they should have done immediately. That's just crazy. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you for taking care of the patients and advocating no, for them I all know. the time. I mean, it's are... just a, such a sad thing. But, I mean, telehealth in general is a great option. You, I mean, even I offer it to my patients that have aligners you know we print in house ourselves sometimes we use invisalign we use a lot of things but i have patients in boston or new york sometimes and i still do telehealth and make sure that everything is going well but at the same time at least they need to come into the office every six months for me to make sure everything is okay not like smile direct club where just like okay here's your trays and that's it bye Absolutely. just pay us <laughs> well thank you for that and thank you for taking our FaceTime. It was awesome talking to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. We'll Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> You're in the practice, yeah, right? Yeah, I was like, okay. Show, here, show us around. <laughs> I'm glad. We that just got good. lucky. Yeah. We just got lucky that she answered. That was fun conversation yeah. with Dr. Yeah. Barnia. What is your stance in terms of orthodontist offering ortho treatments versus general practitioners offering that? You know, as any type of, type of specialty, right? You are the specialist of any area, not because you know how to do things, because you know how to prevent or correct problems, right? So any type of specialty and, you know, orthodontists, we go through an ex intensive program after being a dentist, right? It could be two years, it could be three years, it can vary, but at the same time, you know, we have the proper training to move teeth. That's what we do every day, right? On the other hand, dentists, I'm not saying that they cannot offer those treatments, right? Maybe not the complex treatments as orthodontists, but the public, the public, the patients should know where to go when when stuff like that is needed, right? When a treatment like that is needed. You know, a, a general surgeon can do heart surgery, right? Right. Would you go to a heart surgeon if you know, need heart surgery or you will you go to a general doctor same concept right That's right so i think it's it's important to know their credentials of the doctors and if the if it's a general dentist that has gone through proper tra training to do simple cases or he has the experience to treat other cases i think it's a viable option right mm -hmm. but the one who is specialized in moving teeth is the orthodontist and we've seen companies like Align try to de-skill that, so to offer it to general practitioners, and they were very successful, they have so much success, and uh, essentially GPs are offering pretty complex treatments right now through Align and Invisalign, which is one of the highest valued company in dentistry. No one can deny that success. Right, right. So what's your uh, opinion and that in terms of complex case versus simple case what is there a type of case you recommend yeah i go to gp is cheaper probably you know probably for a mild treatment where the crowding is very mild you know not moderate but if we get into extractions if we get into uh surgical treatments if we get cases with periodontal disease i think the proper the proper thing to do is refer it to an specialist mm -hmm. with for orthodontics, right? I'm not saying that general dentists shouldn't do or they cannot do um, aligners, right? And again, I emphasize this with the proper training, with the proper knowledge of uh, moving teeth, you can those those simple and somewhat moderate 
complex cases. But at the end, at the end of the day, the specialists are the one who who will, should take care of those cases. From a specialist point of view, mm -hmm. what is it that different between GP versus ortho? Because in reality, again, this is me as an engineer talking. It's two years of extra education you get. And over five, six years of practicing, you can pretty much gain that expertise, right? What is it that the orthodontists have, GPs don't have? And you advocate for that. So let's say that the GPs, they do different procedures, right? right? Different procedures, you know, from uh, preventive dentistry, uh, you know, fillings, cosmetics, uh, implants, extractions, periodontal disease so they can they get to see every single um, spectrum of dentistry right the orthodontist only concentrate on moving teeth one thing focus on one thing right and we go back to what i was saying you know a general doctor in medicine could su see different things but the oral the uh, heart surgeon only concentrates in heart right so similar concept and as you were saying you know if the general denti dentist it concentrates only on a practice related to orthodontics. Maybe uh, with some time we can, um, mm. it can match up in terms of a recent graduate or somebody that has been doing moving teeth or braces or aligners in certain time. But at the end, the one, the orthodontist the is the one, the focus of that is just moving teeth. The other thing I was explaining to a friend of uh, a friend of mine mm -hmm. wanted to take uh, his daughters to a GP versus ortho. I recommended orthodontist. Uh, the reasoning I brought was GPs are great when things go right, but when things go wrong, they don't know what's happening. Those corrections to perfectly land the plane is where an orthodontist essentially come in handy, and they can expertise will land that plane. You know. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Is when everything goes right, right, everything goes right, right. But the orthodontist is the one that could prevent those things to go wrong, and not only that, will have the knowledge of how to correct those problems. Those problems. Because that's that's all that's all we do, right? And at AAO, you all are spending so much uh, energy and resources to educate the. Market you, on that, right? You know, it's only not the education for for the patients. I think is education of the patients, advocacy for for orthodontists, and most importantly, knowing letting the patients know what it means to have an orthodontic treatment. Right? The orthodontic treatment is something that you know can change your life, can change your smile, can change the perception of so many things, but also your health. Right. Right. So I think it's just so important. To let our patients know what what is out there, Doctor Cruz, there was a video that AAO created. It was comparing, or educating the general public about the treatment with an orthodontist versus the treatment in a GP practice. And I, I was trying to find it right now, get your reaction. I couldn't find it. What happened to that video? You know that uh, video pretty much just came to um, the life of the video is 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 done. You know, there's there's certain th uh, videos that it has a, a life of the video. And at the end with that video, what we wanted to do is just to uh, educate the patients, right? Educate the public, what is the difference between an orthodontist and a general dentist? Maybe the optics was not probably well perceived by the community. Oh, I see. Uh, the dental community. So you got complaints. But that was a, <laughs> we get like comments. comments. We get like comments and by any means, the, the goal was to kind of talk bad about the dentist, right? right? Because at the end, we collaborate. We are uh, we're in the best interest of the patients because we work together. We, we work together. That's what we do. You know, the way that the referrals work or how we get to see patients is some, the dentist will send patients to the orthodontist. We'll take care of the orthodontist. And the orthodontist, once it's done, it will continue and will inform the dentist that the treatment is done, everything went well, this is the before and after, and it's a collaboration. So mm -hmm. we were just um, trying to emphasize 
and share with the public and educate the public right. what was the difference between them. But by any means, was nothing well, directly didn't that. So go well. uh, it, it didn't go. It <laughs> probably, as, as in the, the optics were not probably, or the perception was not the right. But by any means, you know, we have a great relationship with all the dentists, and you know, we we keep that re great relationship because at the end, we work together for the benefit of the patient. Very true. So, how much does a uh, ortho treatment costs in a GP versus orthodontist? Is it a cost difference? I'm not sure. And and to tell the truth, I have seen, and even I'm across the states. Right. What is it, I let's say, your, your zip code? I'm in Austin, uh -huh. right? And treatments can vary between 4,000 to 6,000, right? 4,000 to 6,000. Doesn't depends, matter, GP doesn't or GP, So it's 2,000 so, dollars know, basically four, delta. 4,000 to 6,000. Uh -huh. But also I have seen some ads where you can do, get your treatment done for $2,500. <laughs> wow. So it varies. But again, at the end, what, what we're going with this is it's not the price. It's not the... You have to make sure that whatever is doing your treatment, either a GP or an orthodontist, they have the right credentials. And not only that, they have the experience of how to do a proper treatment. Do orthodontists make more money in general than GPs? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It depends how you practice, Ron, right? Well, what's the average because salary for a successful orthodontist? It varies. Hey. It varies. It varies. You know, some numbers throw could be, you know, between uh, 250000 to $350,000, Starting. right? And for dentists, could be between 180000 to 150000 to 250000 right? right? So it varies the amount of days that you're working. It varies that how many, how involved you are. I have seen some GPs making it's more than a million dollars, half a million side, dollars yeah. implant side. Um, so it varies, but I think at the end, either both professions are, um, it requires a lot of work, you know, uh, something that we're looking at is also, when you graduate from dental school or orthodontic school, there's a lot of loans behind, right? Yeah. And at the end, once you, uh, either you, you're an employee or either you are a, a business owner or you're an entrepreneur, open your own practice. At the end of the day, you can do a good, um, a good living. Enrique, with the three specialties that you have, which one is your favorite these days and how you spend your time? I'll tell you, I'll tell you from something. From one to another, yeah. When I, came, when I came to the States, my goal was to do an oral surgeon, being an oral surgeon in the United States. The issue with that is I had to do dental school and then do the program itself. So it was going to take me six years, seven years to, to do this, right? So that's why I wanted to do periodontics because it will involve surgery. It will involve, of course, uh, different uh, soft tissue grafts and all the, all the, um, the surgical setup, right? right? But at the time, Indiana had a dual program, which was periodontics and orthodontics, right? It's very rare. So they don't have it anymore in oh, Indiana. Oh, wow. I think probably Pennsylvania and I'm not sure. I think that's, that's the only school that is offering as a combined per se, right? But through this program, I was able to see patients with surgery, right? Patients that had periodontal disease and then do the orthodontic treatment. So at the end, everything got combined. So in my practice, one day I do ortho, one day I do surgery, and one day I do both. So I go back and forward with everything. But um, I enjoy all of them. I enjoy. It's very hard. It's a very hard question because I I've truly, I truly, it's, it, there's a different, as an orthodontist, the rewarding part is when you take the braces off, right? Right. The interactions with the patients. The way you interact with the patient for 24 months or 30 months, you see them grow, you see them build their confidence, you see them build this new smile, you see them, you're part of the family, right? So that's something very unique with, in, with the orthodontic profession. Because even as a dentist, you get to see them every six months or you get to see them every year. Build a relationship, it's, yeah. But the relationship with the orthodontist that you get to see them every four, six, or every eight weeks during the treatment is different. Mm -hmm. So you get to see them as they grow and you get to see them as they graduate. You get to see them as they get married, as, as they have kids. So that part is very rewarding. 
-hmm. So that's why now it's hard for me to decide which one I want to do. Of course, the rewarding part of surgery or a periodontist is we get to, let's say we do a surgery and we see the immediate, immediate results, right? Kind of immediate um, uh, rewarding, right? But the periodont as a periodontist, you get to save teeth, you get to make, uh, patients will go through a process where they will be able to maintain their teeth. So that's very rewarding too, right? So every aspect of what I do, it has a very rewarding part. Now it's very hard for me to decide which one will be the best. How much do you use technology in your day-to-day -day of those three? In every aspect, you know, orthodontics, we use scanners. What scanner we do you use, use? Currently we're using Daitero. Daitero. And photography, mm -hmm. we use uh, 3D printers. You know, we use Spring, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Of course, of course. <laughs> Surgery. We use, a, you know, CVCT. Sure. We do guided surgeries. We do also, we do 3D printing. 3D printing. And on the periodontal part, also we use a uh, different type of, um, you know, bone materials, a scan, also scan. We use the scanning also. We, we can print um, guided surgery for, for implants. So among those three, scanners, Common printers printing, common. And surgery and CVCTs CVCT. are something that I can split with. All. What and kind of implants? What are your top implants? You know, I use uh, Noble Care, Stroman, Hyosin. So it sometimes depends on what the dentist feels comfortable restoring sure. or what company they know how to restore. So that's how I pick. But I, an implant is an implant. And what end. aligner brand do you use? We have three different types, right? right? And this depends on the complexity of the case, and we use in-house aligners. Some so of them for you print. moderate, we print our own, and we offer that uh, type of treatment for our patients, where you know it's it's kind of like more limited treatment. The other one we use Invisalign and also a Spark. Spark, and Spark, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Invisalign and Spark there go pr pretty much hand in hand. In hand, hand. To hand. Yeah, and in hand, so we good. can split, split that. Do patients pick? Like, I want Invisalign. Is it that Some element too? I, we haven't seen it a lot. It's just um, there's certain things that one aligner to the other have different variations that we like as clinicians. Right. So sometimes we pick, okay, well, this one will go to Invisalign, this one will go to Spark, or patients will come and say, you know what, I want my Invisalign, you know? And they don't know there is aligners. And you don't try to talk them out of it. Yeah, you it's just, just like give them whatever, whatever they want. Whatever you want. But uh, I think it's a very viable, viable option for a patients to pick what they want, right? But also, we're going to decide in what will be the best for them. Because sometimes they come for aligners and we'll say, hey, you cannot you have aligners. You yeah, need you braces. Yeah, what's the percentage of bracket and wire versus aligners in your practice? So, right now, we are probably around 30 to 70, sometimes 60 to 40, right? 60, and what's the bigger one? Is brackets? Or yes, oh, brackets. I see. Still brackets. Is the thing is, our practice is a multidisciplinary practice where I we treat a lot of adult patients. And I'm not saying that aligners are not for adult patients, but it requires sometimes implants, sometimes extractions, sometimes different aspects that with aligners could be a little more complicated. But in general, for teenagers or regular um, just normal dentitions that is not a multidisciplinary case, we can do aligners. On the technology part of things, how much, besides social media, how much technology gave you competitive advantage marketing? I think not necessarily just a competitive advantage, is more the benefit for the patient, mm -hmm. you know, because what we can we have achieved with uh, the newest technologies, you know, 3D printing. 3D printing is something that we adapted probably a couple of years ago. And we are able to start aligners the same day, right? Perfect. Where the patient comes and we do the consultation. Yes, you're a viable candidate for, for aligners. We take x-rays, we take pictures, and we said, do you want to start today? Mm -hmm. And as the patient is getting the pictures taken, or the x-rays, we scan the teeth, right? We can design the first sets of aligners and within 30 minutes to 45 minutes, we can give them the first set. So that has been that's something a, that is the benefit for the patient because uh, 
they don't have to come back for a different appointment. So that's that's something great that we case can, acceptance, we can do. Getting case acceptance, getting them going. Case acceptance. The other one is retainers, right? A patient comes for the final day for, uh, let's say, braces. We're removing your braces, and we say, okay, your appointment is going to take probably two hours. And at the end of your appointment, you're going to get your retainers. Retainer. Sorry. And you print that. And you print that. So the process is we remove the braces, we polish the teeth, we make sure that everything is, is, is good for retention. We scan it and we send it to the printer. And with the technology and how fast the printer, and again, we use, we yeah, use we print rate, it's been great because it's, it's fast. And within 30 minutes, we can get the models. And by the time the patient is done with pictures and explanation of how to take care of your teeth, we get the retainers. So 100% that's printed right now? 100%. You don't send out yeah, to labs? Yeah, we don't send out to labs. It's amazing. And uh, among all of this busyness of your life, uh, how, why did you start a dental assistant school? <laughs> I'm coming from, um, from a dental family. Uh -huh. right? I have 25, 26 dentists in the family. Really? We have oral surgeons, we have orthodontists, we have endodontists, we have pediatric dentists, we wow. have all this, pretty much all the special specialties. Did you raise the bar or you, you're an average right now? You know, I, I was the first of the of the cousins, right? I see. Um, the uh, first dentist in my family, there was one of my uncles, and then from there, all of us, mm -hmm. right? I think I'm the only one with more specialties, <laughs> but at the same time, I enjoy what I do. You know, I think I was able to share my passion for what I do and my cousins and my, you know, my family was able to pick up on that and they became dentists. So education for us and sharing what we do in a day-to-day -day basis as a family is very important. So when we create our office, the plan was always to teach. To teach. One way or the other. You know, I'm, I'm part-time faculty yes, in San Antonio. Yes. But I always wanted to have something that I can create. Your own uh, academy. All academy or in this case, you know, dental assistance. Because in in the orthodontic field, we are kind of suffering for workforce, right? Right. You know, staff issues and Hygienic, different aspects. Yeah. Hygienists, uh, orthodontic assistants, dental assistants. It's very hard to get. But I didn't do it for those reasons. Of course, I get the benefit of right. it, right? But the reason was to share all these years of, of knowledge, all these things that, because the dental field is something that I am very passionate about. And for me to be able, we have graduated more than 250 students. 250? 250 in almost to four years. A lot of fellow colleagues so, will appreciate you for, you because know, it's a big shortage. Sometimes we get a call that, hey, when is the next class finishing <laughs> up? And something that we do for our students is once we're they're getting ready to graduate, we try to allocate them, you know, within the Austin community. That's right. So it's been a great thing. That's amazing. It's been a great thing. Very rewarding. Very cool. Any final thoughts on technology, ortho, teledentistry? You know, I think I think teledentistry is a, it's a great thing doing the right way. In the right, right way. in doing the right way, doing with the proper followings, doing with the proper um, diagnosis, and technology has given us the opportunity to monitor patients remotely. Right, monitor patients. There are so many companies that are uh, creating the proper ways to continue monitoring patients by with teledentistry. Right, in terms of three D printing, I think is is in the last two years. It's been incredible. Took off, huh? Incredible. Took off. You know, we can print uh, models. First was models. I think was the first thing that I was looking at, you know, printing models. Now we can print night guards and we can print crowns. We can print all on fours, temporaries. So I think, you know, looking forward for the next few years, see where is this is going to be. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend, for coming to the podcast. Thank Appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And, and you're very excited to share all this. Thank you. Thank you.